Oké. Okay. Jó estét kívánok, kedves hölgyeim és uraim, Colin Fitzgerald vagyok, és én egy kommunikációs és interkulturális tréner vagyok a Link Global Business solutions -ben. És uh, sajnos ennyi. Szóval, uh, so, so obviously, I'm not going to give my whole presentation in, in Hungarian. Uh, I wouldn't send you to that fate. I think it would take all night. Um, maybe with a little bit of palinka, I could, I could do it. Um, it would probably in, improve my Hungarian skills by about a thousand percent. Um, but so you may be wondering uh, what I'm doing here, what I'm doing here in Mishkots. And the short answer is that my, my wife is from here. Uh, the long answer, that's a story for another day. That, that'll take too long. Um, but in short, I was born in Ireland and I grew up in California. Uh, and now I'm here with you tonight. Um, and has anyone, anyone been to California? Has anyone been there? Yeah, one, two. Yeah, so a little bit different than Mishkots. It's, 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 it's slightly different, okay? Not just the weather. Um, but so, uh, tonight I'd like to invite you to learn and explore uh, four key communication skills. I'd like to give you some tips on those, okay? So is everyone all right with that? Yeah? Okay. So, as I mentioned, um, I was born in Ireland, but I grew up in California. And when I was in my early 20s, I went back to Ireland to, to find my roots or something silly like that. Um, and I worked at this hotel outside of Dublin. And I worked with Lithuanians, Poles, Romanians, and of course, Hungarians. And that was my first uh, experience with Hungarians. And I learned to really get to love their cynical and a little bit dark humor. Uh, so it kind of grew on me. Um, and that's also where I met my wife. Not, not in that hotel, but, but in Ireland. Uh, and then we moved to Madrid, Spain. And there I was a uh, business English teacher. And I would travel to businesses and teach English to groups and individuals. And, you know, I'm, I'm a small town boy from California. And, and I'm used to big roads, big cars, big wide open space, and, and my personal space too. And in Spain, my personal space disappeared. It didn't really exist. Uh, so a little bit of a culture shock for me there. And as I said, I taught uh, individuals and groups. One of those individuals was very high up in his company. And we would meet once per week and have our two-hour class. And I would always go with my prepared class, and this is what we're going to do, and it's going to be great. And every week, he would bring me down to the cafe, and we would drink coffee and smoke cigarettes for two hours and talk about our personal lives instead of having a class. And that worked for him. Um, and it kind of taught me that the Spanish really mix all those things together. Uh, their lives are very public. Most of their life takes place in cafes, on the streets. Um, so that was a big lesson for me. And then, of course, in 2006, I came to Hungary for the first time. And so began my relationship with Pailinka and Disno Vagash. Uh, and, and now I have quite a lot of experiences with both, uh, mostly positive, some, some negative, but we won't talk about those. Um, and then in 2015, I moved to Hungary with my wife, and I started my blog, uh, The Paprika Project. Uh, maybe some of you have heard of it. Uh, maybe not, but it was uh, quite successful and also a bit controversial as I shared my opinions about Hungary and my experiences. Um, and then I also wrote a few articles uh, for a well-known travel website and my favorite, uh, How to Piss Off a Hungarian. And this was meant to be a comedy piece, but you know, some people took it differently. And, and I think my, my wife will agree that I'm an expert at pissing off Hungarians like her. Okay, so. As I mentioned, the first time I visited Hungary uh, was in 2006. And, you know, I could see that Hungarians had great products, okay? I could see that Hungarians had um, great services. Uh, and of course, I could see that Hungarians had great ideas, right? Hungarians are, are famous for their ideas. We all know that.
convincingly, uh, a bit more structured, in a more structured manner, and definitely in a bit more of a diplomatic way, in English, of course, right? You, you're very good in Hungarian, obviously. Um, and I, I think you'll all agree that communication uh, really is at the heart of, of global business, right? And I, I think in today's world, um, speaking English well uh, isn't enough anymore. You need to be able to uh, communicate effectively in everyday business situations, okay, in everyday contacts, or contexts, I should say. Um, and we've identified five of these areas, and we've built training solutions around them. And they are emailing, meetings, presentations, negotiations, and intercultural skills, okay? And so what we offer in a nutshell is uh, business communication skills training, a little bit tall, I'll move that up, um, and our participants in our training improve their soft skills and situational language, okay? And I think um, as technology becomes a bigger and bigger part of our lives, we are really focusing on hard technical skills, right? And that's a, that's a global phenomenon. And I think with social media, that's also impacting our social skills, uh, our real life social skills, right? So in-person social skills. And we're kind of losing those, those interpersonal skills. Uh, we're losing the, the art of the conversation, right? The dance, the game of a, of a conversation. And I think these, uh, these words from uh, Jeff Weiner, the CEO of LinkedIn, uh, say it best. So interpersonal skills is where we're seeing the biggest imbalance. Communications is the number one skills gap. And, and those are his comments on uh, a, a, a multi-city study done in the US on the imbalances in the workplace. And you know that's in the US, but, but what about Hungary? What do you think? Do you think we have a, a skills imbalance in terms of soft skills in the workplace? Does anyone have any, any thoughts on that? Well, in Debrecen, uh, my partner John started this company seven years ago, uh, Link Global Business Solutions, and we've had a lot of success there. We've worked with uh, over 100 companies and trained over 500 of their people. And while we've worked with, with multinationals um, like National Instruments, um, like uh, Schaeffler here, our best partners are our IT partners and companies like Dintel, Data Expert, RDI, Neuron, Inonic, for example. And one thing all these companies have in common uh, is that they're working internationally or would like to, and they're open to uh, improving their company by investing in their people through training. All right, so I'd like to invite you now to learn uh, a few of these uh, skills, or I'd like to give you some tips, okay? So let's get started with that. Um, and first we're gonna look at emailing. And this is coming from our effective emailing training. And so, you know, how do you structure an email well? Uh, how do you write a good subject line? And there was a study done by uh, MailChimp and they found that a subject line between two and seven words achieved the highest opening rate. All right, and what about uh, adjusting formality and tone in your emails in English, right? How do you do that? Well, let's, let's take a little bit of a deeper look into that. Uh, and there are four ways that I'll share with you. And the first one is the length of expressions that you're using. So the longer the expressions, uh, the more descriptive, the more technical, or the more polite, uh, obviously you're being more formal. And, and we can say the same about vocabulary. If you're using longer, more technical words, right, you're being more formal. Uh, and what about contractions? Okay, and contractions are, right, so could not becoming couldn't, uh, did not becoming didn't, right? So the more contractions you're using in your emails, the more casual you're being, all right? And so what about directness? How direct are you being in your emails? Are you getting right to the point? Or are you kind of beating around the bush? You have your formalities, introductions, or are you getting right to the point? Let's look at that a little bit deeper. Um, so 
how to adjust your formality and tone according to directness. So we have you know, Mr. Businessman here, and then we have kind of uh, Facebook kind of tech guy at the bottom, it looks like. So I wonder if you might like to. I wonder if you might like to have lunch, right? That's pretty formal. It's quite long, pretty polite. The next one, would you like to? Okay, so a bit shorter, but still polite, and I think appropriate for, for most business emails. Uh, the next one, do you want to? So things getting a bit shorter here, less complicated. And that's maybe if you have an established relationship with someone. Uh, can you? Can you? So, can you meet me for lunch? Um, quite short, quite informal, but the use of the word can can be much more persuasive. So if I said, uh, please, can you help me? Or can you please help me? Uh, that's much more persuasive than could you, maybe, would you help me? Right? Can is much more persuasive. By adding please, you can actually make it formal. Uh, and the last one, do it. So I'm not even asking you, I'm telling you, I'm commanding you. It's a demand, do it. Uh, I think you know, that doesn't really have a place in your business emails, um, unless maybe your boss is saying, great job, it looks perfect, go ahead, do it. But otherwise, it's, it's quite rude, I think. Okay, so those are some tips on, on emailing, and we're gonna move on to meetings. And I think we've all been in, in bad meetings and good meetings. We've, we've seen, uh, or we've, we've experienced both of those. Um, and one of the most important things in meetings is the role of the facilitator. Okay, so if you're having a serious meeting, you're gonna need to have a facilitator. And a facilitator is really like a project manager for your meetings. And they're gonna establish uh, the ground rules. They're gonna tell you about the scope of the meeting, what the objective is, et cetera. Uh, and one of the most important things is for them to encourage uh, active and equal participation uh, from the people in the meeting. Um, also, being a, a neutral person, a, a, a facilitator must be a neutral person in the meeting. And that's so they can manage and avoid conflict. Uh, another reason they want to be neutral is because they want to ensure that there are quality decisions made in the meeting. So, not decisions based on emotion, or lack of time, or, or ego, right? They want to act in the best interest of the company as the facilitator. And, and also, we could talk about questions. So a good facilitator knows how to ask good questions, clarification questions, to get people to open up. So that leads us to questions, right? How do you ask better questions in your meetings? And you really want to avoid uh, those, those leading questions so you're trying to get the person to give the answer that you want them to give, okay? And that's kind of closing them in instead of just asking them, what do you think? Uh, don't ask either or questions, right? Either or. Would you like to do either this or that? You're giving them only two options. What if, what if there are three options? What if there are ten options, right? You're really putting them in that box uh, and, and limiting the options, the opportunities. And finally, uh, do ask clarification questions. Even if you, you think you already know the answer, uh, by them clarifying further, you can get to the bottom of, of why they want something and not just what they want. And then people will understand them a bit better and you might agree with them. Okay, and what about uh, difficult people in meetings? We, we all know difficult people in meetings. Uh, so for example, the dominators, the people who take over the whole meeting and, and won't shut up. Um, how do you deal with them? What about storytellers? Again, people who start telling a story that's leading nowhere and taking up everybody's time. How do you pull them back in? Well, you want to do it diplomatically, of course. Uh, you want to thank them for their input and say, yeah, but we need to move on. We have an agenda. And I'd like to hear from Gabor over here. Okay? So you need to interrupt them and move things forward as a facilitator. Okay, so just, just a few tips on meetings. And now we'll move into my favorite uh, training and give you some tips on my favorite topic, which is presentations, okay? And so how do, you, how do you capture your audience's attention at the beginning of your presentation? Well, my technique was, was to start in Hungarian, right? In my terrible Hungarian and get your attention like, uh-oh, I thought this was gonna be in English. I don't know if it worked, maybe, uh, but that was my technique. Um, but what do you do 
with your body, with your voice, to, to add impact to your presentations. Uh, I think there's probably no one better to ask this question to than our good friend, Mr. Chuck Norris. Uh, and, and Chuck Norris knows all about impact, right? And he's ready for his presentation with his, his Uzis, uh, which you probably want to remove those and just have your hands ready to make gestures. Um, I think we could button up his shirt while, while his hairy, shiny chest is very impactful. It doesn't really fit for business presentations, right? Um, and eye contact. He's, he's doing okay with the eye contact, but it's a, a little bit too intense. I think we could tone it down. Um, so we could ask ourselves, how can we add more Chuck Norris to our presentations? Maybe a you know, slightly less aggressive Chuck Norris. All right, so let's look at, at presentations, and we're gonna look at how you can open your presentation with a bang. And there are a lot of ways you can do that. Uh, you can start with a, a striking statistic, like 98% up there on the screen, and that's it. And you're wondering, what 98% what? Of what? I will tell you, right? I could ask you a question. I could ask the audience a question. I could make a controversial statement even about the audience. Okay, that'll get your attention. Uh, or I could start with a, a short story uh, that, that has some meaning to it that could grab your attention. All right, so in terms of effective communication, uh, there are many things we can do, but it's important for us to realize that we put too big of an emphasis on vocal and verbal communication, but visual communication actually accounts for 55% for of effective communication. Right, so what you're doing with your face, what you're doing with your body, your gestures, and of course, what you're doing with your eyes. Okay, so eye contact, very important. And, and why do we use eye contact? Well, we wanna establish or develop rapport or, or build a relationship, make a connection with your audience. All right, I also, or we also wanna use uh, eye contact to uh, get some feedback, to see how you're being received. Are, are people paying attention to me, or, or are they on their phones? Are they looking out, well, there's no window here, but looking out the window. Um, how do you grab their attention back? Well, you could start asking questions, right? You could just call on a guy who's not paying attention and say, okay, what did I discuss in the last slide? Now everyone's gonna pay attention, right? Because they don't wanna be put in the spot. They don't wanna look stupid. Um, but that's kind of an extreme way to get people's attention back. There are, there are easier ways. Um, and again, on eye contact, you really want to share your eye contact equally. And a way to do that is, is maybe divide the room up into three, uh, into thirds, three parts, and choose a friendly face in each part and just focus on them. I mean, I'm not going to look at every single person, right? That's impossible. And, and be aware of the differences across cultures. In some cultures, uh, extended direct eye contact is threatening or rude, right? In some Asian cultures. Um, we could even think about in the animal world, direct eye contact with a gorilla for too long, he's gonna feel threatened, okay? So, what about gestures? Why do we use gestures? We use them to visually emphasize or, or, or reinforce what we're trying to say, right? So, uh, there are uh, lots of gestures you can use, like I felt or I believe, you can do this, or you can use the give, like I'd like to invite you to learn, right side, left side. You can use the chop to emphasize a point, like this, you can do this as well. Uh, you can count with your fingers, right? But you don't wanna do this, you don't wanna finger point. Uh, that's what politicians do, right? Or, or our good friend uh, Donald Trump, he does this. He says billions and billions and billions and billions. There's that video of him where he says billions like 100 times, or billion times. Um, and also, you wanna make sure that you're not sending mixed messages. So, for example, I'd like to tell you about three very important points. Oh, right, yes, okay. So you wanna make sure you're not mixing up your messages here. All right, so we've talked about presentations, and very quickly, for the sake of time, I'd like to go over negotiations um, and give you a few tips on that. And, you know, what we try to do in our negotiations training is we try to teach people to be more principled negotiators. And that means, you know, not I win, you lose, but we both win, mutual success, okay? 
And the way you can do that is find out um, people's interests. So not just their position or what they want, right? But their interests, why they want it. If I know why you want something, um, perhaps there are other options, other opportunities that can come up where we can even be more successful together in, in other negotiations, right? So you don't just want to focus on the, the problem. You want to focus on more solutions that you can build uh, out of those options. Uh, we also teach people to develop their BATNA. Does anybody know what a, what a BATNA is? Anybody? So a BATNA, you don't count. <laughs> a, a BATNA is a best alternative to a negotiated agreement. All right, so if you're going into an agreement or a negotiation, I should, should say, um, you want to think about your options beforehand and have a plan B, plan C, plan D, plan E, maybe. There might be many other options that, that you can have if the negotiation is unsuccessful, okay? You want to make sure you have backup plans. And that can even be something that you can have in your back pocket, so to speak, and bring out in the negotiation if it fails. Okay, well, there's this option as well. Okay, and while you're not reaching what you wanted, um, you can still have a successful negotiation. And finally, when dealing with uh, different cultures, uh, we want to have a different negotiations approach. If I'm negotiating with uh, Japanese or Germans or Brazilians, I'm going to need to have a different approach, right? Those are much different cultures and they do things differently. So just to... to uh, take a note on that. And finally, so I've, I've given you um, some tips on these four core communication areas. And I'd like to focus now on intercultural skills and, and the importance of intercultural cooperation. And in this training, we help people to realize that we're, we're all different. And we all come from our own uh, cultural frame of reference. And we, we really, you know, we don't see things as they are. We, we see things as we are, okay? So we have our own cultural filter, um, and that comes from our families, from our schools, our workplaces, our society, our history. That's our cultural frame of reference, and that's how we see the world. And HSBC did a great series of culture ads a few years ago, and I'd like to share with you my favorite one, if I can. The English believe it's a slur on your host's food if you don't clear your plate. Whereas the Chinese feel you're questioning their generosity if you do. At HSBC, we never underestimate the importance of local knowledge. Which is why we have local banks staffed by local people in over 80 countries across the globe. Okay! HSBC, the world's local bank. Okay, so, so our, our English friend found himself in a... No? Yeah, okay. Our English friend found himself in a situation. Um, in English culture, it's polite to clear your plate, right? To show your host that you enjoyed the food. I think this, it's the same in Hungary, yeah? More or less. Um, in China, if you clear your plate, you're questioning your host generosity. Like, that's it? Where's the rest? Right? So, obviously, he got more eel uh, <laughs> that night. All right, so let's look at Hofstede's cultural dimensions. I'm not going to cover all of them, but we use these to uh, give companies advice on how to deal with different cultures. And there are six of them, uh, and we won't go into all of them. We don't have time for that. But we'll focus on collectivism versus individualism. Okay? And so here we have a few countries... Uh, on the scale, collectivists versus individualists. And, you know, there are some surprises here and some that are not surprising at all, like China, no surprise. Collectivists, right? What about India? They're, you know, almost in the middle, but still on the collectivist side. What about Hungary? Where does Hungary go? 
Individualists, you think? Yeah? Yeah, you guys, you guys know yourselves, yeah. So, 80, right? Which is actually quite surprising, quite interesting. Because if you look at other uh, former socialist countries, or whatever you want to call it, um, they're still very much on the collectivist side. But Hungarians, you know, it's all about the individual, uh, your immediate family, you're in it for your own self-interest. And of course, America, 91, yeah, of course, no surprise there. But I think, you know, being an individualist society uh, is great. You're, you're sort of, you feel like you're in charge of your own destiny, that you're writing your own story, right? And I think people, people like to work with people that they like. People like to work with people who are like them, okay? It's just human nature. And I think by perhaps learning more about different cultures and getting to know their cultural frame of reference, uh, we can build better partnerships and build more sustainable success together that's based on understanding uh, actual real data that you can use, like Hofstede's data, to work with other cultures and have that solid foundation of understanding between the two cultures, not just guessing or interpreting their behaviors based on your own cultural frame of reference. Okay, so that's all for me about uh, intercultural cooperation, but I'd like to leave you with this quote, which I think is very appropriate uh, for tonight's talk. And this is from Paul J. Meyer. So communication, the human connection, uh, is the key to personal and career success. And I, I think that's very true, especially in today's day and age. All right, thank you very much, Colin Fitzgerald with Link Global Business Solutions. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'll, I'll take them now. Thank you. Thank <clears throat> you.